This is the Bloomberg Surveillance Podcast. I'm Tom Keen, along with Jonathan Farrow and Lisa Abramowitz. Join us each day for insight from the best in economics, geopolitics, finance, and investment. Subscribe to Bloomberg Surveillance On Demand on Apple, Spotify, and anywhere you get your podcasts. And always on Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Terminal, and the Bloomberg Business App. Right now, we're going to dive into this. This is really important. I'm going to give you a little bit of visibility here. There are people like Mandeep Singh and our Anurag Rana who actually walk in offices, sit down at desks, and work. Their hallmark, their guidepost, is a guy named David Cutler. Dave Cutler was legendary at Digital Equipment Deck years ago in Maynard, Massachusetts. They stole him to the west coast of Microsoft. He was one of the founding forces behind something we all do, Windows NT. Mandeep Singh joins us now and knows Dave Cutler, the giant of Microsoft programming. This is about Dave Cutler's. All this is about is this kid Altman can bring the meat over to Microsoft. Look, I, I think uh, in this case, it sounds like the CEO uh, was too <coughs> overconfident and didn't really talk to his executives and you know the board. And uh, you come to a point where he was making all the decisions about the future of the company. And look, right. there's no doubt the market is real. I don't think you, know, you can compare it to a Theranos or one of the hypes here because there are so many other competing companies that are trying to do the same. The CEO really wanted to move fast in this case, right. and uh, clearly the board and the executives weren't, uh, you know, uh, in line with. There will be this forty thing. phone calls made today. Mr. Altman Brockman, I believe it is, who's joining him, is is well. What are the attributes they will use to sell a given really, really super bite first in their class, and, and everything? One of these whiz kids. What will, what are the attributes they sell to say join us at Microsoft? Well, so clearly Microsoft is the compute infrastructure that's powering all the open AI, LLM development. Yeah, but what are they doing? Come on, stock options? Is it Mariner's tickets? What, what, uh, you know, what, what gets these guys to move their, their slide rule over to Microsoft? I mean, that could be an exit, but I, I can't imagine Microsoft really going out of the way to attract talent. Look, they hired Sam Altman, and they will leave it on him to figure out which of the engineers really he wants on his team at, at Microsoft and how to get how there. How much do they make a year? Well, uh, we're talking about uh, over a million dollars for uh, all of these engineers. So clearly, yeah, that's... Why is this guy so important? So he was the face of uh, OpenAI, and think of you know ChatGPT as the verb when it comes to generative AI. That's why it got so much traction, and he was the face of the company. But clearly, uh, there were a lot of engineers behind the scenes that were part of the development, and they weren't <coughs> on board with his approach. They had concerns around AI safety, and that's one thing that I, I think everyone needs to think about in terms of you know the roadmap for when this technology will be deployed. There is a lot going on in terms of developing it, but in terms of really changing your production environments with generative AI, it could be a few years, and that's where I think uh, not everyone was in sync. If they were more concerned about safety on <coughs> Friday, are they more or less concerned this morning, now he's at Microsoft? Well, so clearly the talent loss is a big concern, and that's where the board got it wrong, the way they went about it. And uh, clearly, I mean, from all we know, OpenAI could lose uh, almost half of its value just because of the fact that they lost the CEO. But does it raise a question about policing of some of these uh, developments at a place that is focused just on making money, the bottom line, and when expectations are pretty high in the market? Well, so look at the development of, you know, ChatGPT and all these large language models. It's pretty expensive. And for any startup to sustain themselves, right now we are talking about, you know, billion dollar R&D budgets. So how do you sustain it? So I don't blame, you know, Sam Altman for trying to be ahead in terms of monetization and thinking about it. But not having your executives on board about your thinking or your board, I think that's where he got it wrong. Well, but I guess that I'm wondering uh, from a humanitarian standpoint, if we're going to go with some of the ideals that they're talking about, and the fact that the board was concerned uh, about bots that could kind of take on a life of their own and give all sorts of information online, we're already seeing some sort of emblems of that. How much does that just get magnified with a move to Microsoft 
that doesn't necessarily have a nonprofit board trying to espouse these values. Yeah, and look, the Google approach so far has been, they've been very protective about, you know, what they release. So they have been very conservative. A lot of people have actually blamed them for being slow and not releasing their Gemini large language model. But that this sort of validates the Google approach, that you have to take a measured approach when it comes to releasing these models, whether it's open source or proprietary. I think we know uh, OpenAI was, even though it's a nonprofit, everything is proprietary. Well, that's, I think this brings into focus what should be open source and what can the community work on it collectively. And I, I think that's on the table now that Sam is moving to Microsoft. I wouldn't be surprised if they go with an open source approach because uh, Satya Nadella's focus has always been on embracing open source since the time he took the helm. We've had this conversation already a few times this morning. Let's finish there. We've reported that Sam Altman was trying to create some kind of rival to NVIDIA. How seriously should we take that now? He's got a seat at Microsoft. I mean, Microsoft announced a new chip of their own last week, right? So clearly, Microsoft also has ambitions in terms of developing their chip. But at this point of time, I mean, now they have to think about what is the IP that Sam can create over the next six months? Can he develop a large language model that's equivalent to ChatGPT in the next six months? Because it's proprietary. You know that's not coming over. Even if he hires the engineers, the engineers have to build it from scratch. And data availability is in shortage. They can't get the same amount of data that they had before. It's a tough question. Microsoft's up about 1% or so in the pre-market. If OpenAI was trading in the pre-market, where would it be right now? I mean, at least 50% down. You think that hard? Yes, because now their IP is gone. I mean, uh, especially with Sam coming uh, over this side, Microsoft has to redo everything from scratch until unless the board resigns and Microsoft ends up acquiring OpenAI. That's a plausible scenario, but if they have to build it from scratch, now we're talking about a very long timeline. I mean, Google is clearly ahead in terms of developing their model. So everyone's saying that Microsoft has won, but if they've got to write down that stack by 50%, have they won? Well, so, I, I mean, I think talent acquisition is one thing. I do think with, when it comes to large language models, I mean, there are a couple of open source large language models, but you could use that to build uh, yours on top of it. I don't think, uh, you know, you can replicate what ChatGPT had. Again, I go back to the verb analogy because the, everyone thought about, you know, generative AI and ChatGPT as synonymous. Mandeep, thank you, sir, for the update. Mandeep Singh of Bloomberg Intelligence. Joining us, he's on the short list to be the new Minister of the Economy for the Argentine Republic. Andrew Hollenhorst joins us, Chief U.S. Economist at Citigroup. Before we get to the serious stuff at hand, how do you save culturally? I mean, Citigroup, with your incredible Latin American experience there, no other bank has that experience. How do you save Argentina? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it's what we're seeing in Argentina is what we've seen a lot of places across the globe, which is this kind of anti-establishment, <laughs> anti anti-institutionalist anti trend that we're, we're seeing in policymaking. And when you look at the inflation rate in a country like Argentina, you can see why people are looking for a change. How are we, we seem so alone now in a, in a constructive policy out of the pandemic. How alone will American policy be in 2024? I mean, I think one, one thing that really strikes me when you look at U.S. policy relative to the rest of the world is the deficit in the U.S. This is a country now where we're running 6, 7, 8 percent of GDP deficit in a world with a very low unemployment rate. There are very few countries that can do that. The U.S. may be the only one, maybe some other um, examples, uh, that can just consistently run a large deficit like that and continue to provide generous fiscal support. So that it's just a very different situation for the U.S. Big data point this week, jobless claims. Let's go there. You mentioned this in your research. At some point, this loosening of the labor market is an unwelcoming deterioration in the data. Are we close to that on jobless claims? We may be. Um, and I think that's, you know, I think you said it earlier, we're, we're getting some conflicting data here. You have the unemployment rate that's up about half a percentage point over the last few months. If you just look at that data series in isolation and don't try to kind of explain away what you're seeing there, and that's what we tend to do as economists, 
that's what you've seen before every recession. It looks very much like the path into a recession. Um, now, the jobless claims have been low. They're still low, but they're rising. So I think that's the difficulty. We're waiting for data that will confirm one of these narratives, and you just don't have the data in yet. Neil Dutta from Nations Mancra had this great phrase in the last couple of weeks, soft landing nirvana. A lot of people are embracing that soft landing nirvana. Are you still anticipating that this dual mandate of the Federal Reserve is going to be in conflict in the coming quarters? I think more likely than not it will be. Um, And that's just based on the history of what we've seen in cycle after cycle. Uh, It would be great for the Fed. It would be great for the economy if you just had this wonderful Nirvana-like scenario um, where everything kind of slowed on the same schedule. Uh, If we had had a different inflation print last week, we'd be having a very different conversation now. And I think that just shows the extent to which this market is focused on the very recent data. So we had (coughs) softer inflation print. We have jobless claims that are coming up a little bit. That looks like something that could be consistent with a soft landing. But are you going to get some data that starts going in different directions? Probably. And this is probably going to become a lot more difficult for the Fed. But just to build on that, (coughs) is there an inherent conflict in your belief of a growing chance of a hard land? of a recession, but also sticky inflation. Yeah, so I think that's that's the real difficulty, and that's what we, we haven't seen really in decades, where you have inflation that's still running above target, and you have growth that's weakening. Um, now, maybe they're going to happen together, and maybe they happen together in kind of just the right quantum so that you get the soft landing. I think it's a possibility, but the more likely scenario is that we'll have these kind of going in different directions, where inflation probably stays stickier and higher. One issue with inflation and the way that the Fed is conducting its policy is inflation is going to lag what's going on in the rest of the economy. So even if the economy starts slowing down, job market starts loosening, you'll still be running inflation that reflects where the economy was six months ago or a year ago, and six months or a year ago is very strong. So are you saying that the Fed won't be cutting rates as much as people think next year because they won't be able to justify it given where inflation is? Yeah, I think that's really the risk here, and that could happen a couple ways. Um, So you could have this scenario where the activity data is weakening, but you still have inflation that's sticky and high. On the other hand, even if we're on something that ends up looking more like a soft landing trajectory eventually, there wouldn't be a lot of urgency for the Fed to cut rates in that scenario. Um, I know theoretically, if inflation comes down, and I agree at some point the Fed would be cutting rates, that could take a very long time before we would actually get those Fed cuts. I need to ask you about the linkage from your UCLA and the giant Amanak in over to William Sharp, who was a student up at Stanford eventually to you, which is the risk-free rate. You absolutely nailed the increase in rates. Do you have any clue where the risk-free rate is in 12 months? Yeah, I, like we were just discussing, it's going to depend on the economic scenario. And I think you have to be open to economic scenarios here. Um, we do know that we're in a world where inflation has been higher, has been more volatile. We know that the correlation between equities and fixed income has flipped. Essentially, you have equity prices that are falling at the same time bond prices are falling. That means there'll probably be some more term premium in there. That means you'll probably have a higher interest rate, all else equal. Um, So if anything, that risk-free rate is probably going to be higher. Andrew, what changed? What changed? What changed about the fundamentals of things that's going to lead to this different outcome now relative to pre-pandemic? I think the single biggest thing you can point to is what's different in goods inflation. And I think that's what we're all not looking at enough right now, because we've had a big disinflation in goods. So I think it's easy to kind of look at that and say, well, we've kind of returned to this pre-pandemic goods deflation. And that's what we had pre-pandemic. Goods prices went down over time. And I think anyone who's been out buying things over the last couple of years, certainly the experience is not that goods prices are down. Now, some of that was specific to the pandemic. Some of that's not going to continue. Uh, But what will continue is this kind of topping out of globalization, maybe going the opposite way in terms of globalization. And that means that stream of low-cost goods is just not going to be there in the same way that it was, putting downward pressure on goods prices. So I think we can expect goods inflation going forward. So this is a secular call for you. It's not a call about the cycle. So that, that's a secular call. Yeah, I think that we're, we're in the idea that inflation now is higher, more volatile, that the economy is more subject to supply shocks than demand shocks. These are structural secular changes. Andrew, great to get your perspective on things. Thank you, buddy. It's good to see you. Thank you. Great to Andrew see you. Andrew Honhorst, The City. 
There is no perception to what 1975 was. It was when a governor from Georgia wandered up north delusional that he could actually win an election. At the same time, Ricky Skaggs, Tony Rice, Jerry Douglas, and others were doing a seminal album in bluegrass, J.D. Crow in the New South, 1975. Terry Haynes uh, remembers this. He remembers the shift of the Old South to the New South. In honor of the First Lady, Terry Haynes, what was the battle that the two Carters had when they invented the New South? Well, uh, the battle that went, that went on was uh, the idea, and this is uh, you know, middle Watergate, post Watergate, the idea that uh, an insurgent uh, could actually shake up Washington. I mean, that was the the, the selling point for Carter. Um, he, you know, he managed to make that case. He won by a little over President <coughs> Ford. Uh, but then he ran into the realities of Washington, where uh, Tip O'Neill and others uh, uh, took him aside and said, no, actually, this is the time where we get to make the policy and you get to sign the bills. And uh, what ended up happening was uh, basically a three-year Democratic food fight that weakened Carter greatly, uh, not least because Ted Kennedy ran against him, and uh, that ended in uh, President Reagan's uh, election. Is this Democratic Party now any shade or idea of what the two Carters knew? Um, yeah, some of them are, uh, but uh, I think that uh, President Carter would likely be uh, you know, unhappy with the you know, progressive direction, uh, largely because, I mean, he would be aspirationally progressive, but the idea that, uh, you know, they, they couldn't win on a particular platform uh, would not be helpful. And, uh, and he'd see the politics, I think, very, very differently than the current group does. Who do you think, Terry, is going to be the torchbearer for the Democratic Party in the next four to eight years? Oh, um, you know, beyond Biden, I mean, there's going to be a lot of people that are going to uh, fight that out from uh, from Governor Newsom uh, to uh, Governor Whitmer of Michigan. Uh, you know, there will be four or five others that will try to pop up. Uh, it's going to be very interesting, uh, the battle for the soul of the party. The problem is uh, is relevancy. What you've got on the left and on the right is a world where uh, the primary system rewards purists and at the same time, uh, the money out there, the money and the energy rewards purists as well. So there's a huge middle in the country that, that feels unserved on a lot of levels. And that's I, I think that's the basis of a lot of the tensions you see politically. Do you think that's the reason why President Biden hasn't stepped down and, and allowed somebody else to run in his stead? Uh, one reason. Yeah. I mean, but, you know, Democrats are you know, the, the old order never passes quietly. Uh, I think historically. And uh, what you've got is in, in Biden is by and large the old order, uh, somebody who you know got there on the promise of, uh, of centrism, of a return to normality. And, uh, and then right. what you've got instead is uh, you know the pull and tug between the centrists and the progressives. And uh, you know that's not the direction the Democratic Party's right. going in. They're going for good or ill in the progressive direction. Terry Haynes, who's the Nikki Haley of the Democrats right now? No. Oh, um, Nikki Haley, goodness. Uh, there isn't one on the radar screen. Uh, every, everybody else uh, who's uh, who's thinking about running went independent. Uh, Whitner is probably the, the closest to that, but I don't think there's a close analog. When you talk about uh, President Biden and some of the poll numbers recently, I'm wondering, given the foreign policy uh, consideration, how much is the lack of popularity going to drive some policy decisions on his part in the coming months? In other words, does it reduce his support of Israel and change any of his Middle East policy? Um, I don't think it changes uh, on uh, Israel. I think he gets a little bit tempted on China. Uh, the Chinese have been uh, you know, dangling a great deal that, uh, you know, if you'd be a little bit more reasonable on Taiwan, we'd work with you on the Middle East. We'd work with you on Russia, Ukraine much more overtly. And, uh, you know, so I think he's a little bit tempted in that direction. Uh, but, you know, the way the White House uh, sees this, and I was following your uh, your. Uh, comments earlier, uh, the way the White House sees this fundamentally is, you know, it's a race against somebody, and they think that people will end up uh, reluctantly pulling the lever, but actually pulling the lever uh, as much to to avoid uh, the likely opposition as anything else. Terry, do you think China would be happy with another Biden term? 
uh, happy? Uh, yeah, I think uh, sure, because uh, what China very likely sees is a lot of muddling through, a lot of uh, a, a lot of pronouncements about new policies, chips, security, and the like, but not a lot of follow through. I mean, there's a headline on the. Uh, South China Morning Post this morning saying, you know, America's building all these chip factories, but the federal dollars haven't started to flow, which is true. And, you know, that's been a year or more after the chips bill was passed. Uh, you know, one of the things that the United States has got uh, in terms of a large problem is uh, follow through as procurement is actually uh, becoming the arsenal of democracy here at this particular point. Terry, appreciate your insight. Thank you, sir. Terry Haynes there of Pangea <coughs> Policy. So, we, you know, we sort of snoozed off with Jane Foley in London last time that we saw her. Maybe we no. could do better. Why don't you bring in Jane here with big moves <laughs> okay. in foreign exchange? Hold on a second. We did not fall asleep. It just seemed to be range bound. And now range we've actually bound. broken out to 109. The low uh, that we got over the past couple of weeks was just a bit ago at 106.77. 10467 <laughs> on Exciting. October 3rd. This has been a big move. Is it the beginning of something more? Jane Foley. That's really my question. You know, are we going to start to see more protracted dollar weakness? Oh, you know, this is, I think, really exciting. Uh, and I think we're at a really pivotal point. And of course, that started with the CPI data. And of course, right now we've got a question, well, is this a little bit overextended? But, you know, one thing is is for certain, you know, that the, the dollar has a pretty good inverted relationship with with, with risky assets, say, say they're uh, emerging market stocks. So, uh, Basically, what that says to us is that when interest rates in the U.S. go down, well, risk appetite globally goes goes up and people move the money out of dollars. So we know that. What we don't know is if the market's got the timing right about, you know, the interest rate cuts coming from the Federal Reserve next year. Are we going to get some pushback? Are we going to get more pushback about that, you know, for the next few weeks? Is the data going to be a little right. bit more choppy? And and I think that's probably what's going to happen. We will get some choppiness there. So so we're probably not on a, on a straight line, but it does appear that we right. are at a really pivotal point, which might just be a little bit more protracted than many people hope it's going to be. Jane, with the multi-decades at Rabobank of hedging is there a bet within this range bound market that will allow for acceleration or convexity of moves? Is there an ability here to be surprised by big figure moves? Well, there's always an ability to be a surprise, and we, you know we've seen a lot of them now. But we know that these central banks are are, are data dependent, and therefore, you know, we, we don't get the forward guidance. Therefore, perhaps there's more scope to be to be surprised um, by all of this. And of course, you know, you mentioned the elections. There's huge amount of elections in 2024. I mean, I think it's it's it, 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 there's a figure like uh, I think countries with a collective population of of more than four billion, half of the world's population will go to the polls next year. So it's not just the U.S. We've got elections okay. in the EU and and, and Taiwan and so many. Really really pivotal places. So there's a lot of scope, I, I think, for, you know, excitement to be injected. Into okay, the well, I love this. Jane, give me a big figure move. Give me your pair where I can make a Bramo like five, six big figure move into June of next year. I think you probably look at the Swedish krona for, for one that's just started to turn around. That had a huge amount of weakness streak for the last couple of years. That's beginning to turn around. I think Kroner we against what? Coming back, uh, even against the euro. Um, you know, the, it, um, if we look at uh, the, the Aussie dollar, if the risk appetite does pick up, and of course that's the big if, uh, it will eventually. But you know, this could be a protractive time of, of right. the market. You know, trying to pick out and maybe knocks back from data, knocks right. back from the Fed. But perhaps if we go, you know, towards the, the, the latter half of next year, I think the Aussie will do really quite well because the fundamentals in, in Australia are really quite good compared with many other countries right. in, in the G10. But of course, that uh, necessitates a, a pickup in China too. So, you know, China is going to be a really important part right. of this risk appetite story and how it emerges but, in 2024. But Lisa, that's right where I wanted to go, which is Aussie off Pacific Rim going north. I don't know who you play, Aussie Sing Dollar, Aussie China. I'll leave that to adults like Jane Foley. But to me, Australia always has a, a, a modest surprise here. Plus, they won at cricket. They beat such an Adela India. So, you know, if they're Long cricket, you go long Aussie. I'll leave you to the cricket updates, but just sticking with the uh, Pacific Rim, there is a question. If you want a real big surprise, maybe Japan is the way to go. And that's what PIMCO is doing, going into the yen, expecting that maybe a bit of softening in the stance of the Fed and even rate cuts sort of gives an opening to a move away from yield curve control. Are you buying that? 
you know, I, I think it will happen, but I, I'm still not too excited about the pace. Um, yes, I mean, I think the, the real story for 2024 will be, yes, uh, more unwinding of yield curve control, but it's it's when are they going to be able to hike interest rates? Uh, and I listened really carefully to, to the comments from New Ada just a couple of weeks ago. He's still really, very cautious. And then we had some very disappointing GDP data from, from, from Japan. Of course, that's what we need. If we had better growth in Japan, we'd all be a lot more confident that they can move away from, from negative interest rates. So we need to watch the economic data. And, and as long as that's sort of disappointing, I think it, it, it's still difficult to get too excited about the pace at which this unwinding net will come. But we have started, or Japan has started the process of this unwind from, uh, uh, you know, very accommodative monetary policy settings. Uh, what the, the question is, is, is how fast can they really go? Jane, let's get away from G10. Let's go to something different, finish on this. How does a country experiencing more than 100% inflation get rid of its currency and replace it with the US dollar. Jane, I'm sure you and the team have given this some thought. How's this going to work in Argentina if this is the road he wants to go down? Well, I mean, that's what he said, dollarization. Uh, you know, and, and I think what they probably do is 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 probably just use the dollar a lot more in, in, in trade, uh, price things in, in the dollar and, and just piggyback off the back of the Fed's much more credible uh, 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 interest rate uh, ability. So it, it, it's, it's just that piggybacking off the Fed as, as much as they possibly can. But you know, this is this is not going to be an easy dynamic, as I think we're all aware. <laughs> going to be nothing easy about this, Jane. Thank you, Jane Foley, there of Rabobank. Full disclosure: I am a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. I can't say enough about its public service back well to World War II, starting with the Kennan SA and other great moments along the way. And I remember, I'm going to say, 15 years ago. When the CFR, the Council on Foreign Relations, had the courage to reinvent themselves digitally, it is one of the greatest successes in anything we do, this in international relations. The website of the Council on Foreign Relations, which is the foundational intellectual input of Richard Haas. So what do you do when Haas exit? The joy is it's Michael Froman, president of the Council on Foreign Relations, to say he's former U.S. trade representative, barely describes the miles he has clocked on airplanes for this nation. Michael, just thrilled you could join us this morning. Congratulations on uh, the new effort with the Council on Foreign Relations. It's a little well, busy out there, Michael. Me. What are you focused on right now? Well, we see the return of great power politics uh, with Russia at war, the emergence of a competition, multi-dimension competition with China. And of course, you've got uh, the war in the Middle East breaking out and global issues like pandemics and climate change still to deal with. So there are a lot of issues on the global agenda, a lot of demands for cooperation and collaboration, yeah. precisely at a time when there's also a lot of fragmentation. So it's a, a very challenging period. There is a bipartisan tone to the Council on Foreign Relations in this new Foreign Affairs magazine, your work with President Obama. There's Mr. Gates, Secretary of Defense, with an important essay in your Foreign Affairs magazine. Is it a bipartisan debate in Washington, or is our politics so fractured we're not having a normal CFR debate? Well, clearly the country is more, po more polarized politically than it's ever been. I think when it comes to foreign policy, national security, uh, there is a bit more of a nonpartisan or bipartisan uh, debate going on. The center left and the center right, I think, uh, uh, share a fair number of, of perspectives. And of course, then there are a wide range of perspectives from uh, in both parties as well. Uh, but right now, whether it's Ukraine or the Middle East, uh, I think the majority of both parties are very focused on providing the necessary support. And when it comes to an issue like China, there's a very strong bipartisan consensus that we need to be very firm with China and reset the relationship. Focus on that, uh, Ambassador Froman. Just taking a look at what happened last week, do you think it truly was more of a success than maybe many people are giving it credit for? I think it was a success in that the, the goal was to stabilize the relationship heading into 2024 when you have elections in Taiwan and elections in the United States where the China issue is clearly going to play uh, a, a role. And I think they 
both achieve that in terms of not just talking, because we, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't confuse a meeting or a conversation with actual progress, but they did make actual progress on issues like military to military conflict management, on fentanyl, uh, on climate change, uh, and on, on really trying to reset the relationship going into, into next year. So you know, President Xi gave a speech in San Francisco, which frankly could have been given seven or 10 years ago. There, there was no wolf warrior diplomacy uh, in, in evidence. Uh, there was no reference to the, the, the challenges and conflicts that have defined the relationship over the last few years. Uh, and I think there's a real effort on their part for their own reasons that the Chinese want to make sure that we have a more benign international environment looking ahead. They want the appearance of at least uh, some sort of back to the future when it comes to the business climate. But there's a real question about how much uh, that really carries through. There was a lot of discussion about them buddying up with Iran. Uh, uh, as well as North Korea, and particularly siding with them with respect to certain issues in Ukraine, as well as in Israel. Today, uh, Russian delegates, uh, excuse me, Chinese delegates are meeting with uh, Arab nations to try to discuss what's going to happen in Israel. Do we have a sense of where they stand on this, of what they are going to argue for? I think that, I think China is trying to figure out what its global role is beyond economics. It, it did play a role in witnessing the normalization of relations a bit between Iran and Saudi Arabia. That was a limited agreement around not bombing uh, Saudi uh, oil infrastructure. Um, it has offered its help in, in Ukraine, but given the fact that it has a friendship without limits with Russia, uh, that help is not being particularly welcomed by the Ukrainians. Uh, and in the Middle East, of course, uh, I imagine the parties in the region will be seeking out support wherever they can in capitals around the world, including in China. Um, I think to the degree that they can play a constructive right. role, of course, it should be welcomed. Uh, but you know, that means really playing a role in providing a public right. good that they've never really done before. China's been amazingly disciplined about pursuing its national interests narrowly defined. Well, and if they really want to be a global power, then they also have to help provide for some of the public good. Uh, Michael, you are more identified with TPP than anyone I know. The failure of Trans-Pacific Partnership, something you worked on. The fact is we are deploying four military bases to the Philippines, two in Cagayan, Isabella, and that long skinny island down towards the South China Sea, Palawan. Is our military doing TPP for us? Is that the actual TPP, is the military expansion of America to the Pacific Rim? I think one thing that's clear is that the more that, that China asserts itself across the region, the more the countries in the region want the U.S. to be present in, and engaged. And they're looking for our engagement in a military security sense, in a political uh, dimension, but also in an economic dimension. This is the most economically dynamic region of the world, and they <clears throat> desperately want the U.S. to be engaged there, not just as a military power, but also as an economic power. Uh, Michael Froman, again, congratulations, new duties at the Council on Foreign Relations. He's the president of the CFR. Subscribe to the Bloomberg Surveillance Podcast on Apple, Spotify, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. Listen live every weekday starting at 7 a.m. Eastern on Bloomberg.com, the iHeartRadio app, TuneIn, and the Bloomberg Business app. You can watch us live on Bloomberg Television and always on the Bloomberg Terminal. Thanks for listening. I'm Tom Keen, and this is Bloomberg.